Hey everyone, um, continuing on with uh, doing my videos and trying to get one out per day right now while there was a lot of questions um, that were asked on that thread. Uh, one of the questions asked was if I could kind of give the highlights of the talk um, I gave at the Physique Summit and um, kind of touch on using a glucometer to assess uh, health and progress in the off season um, and how I use it for peak week. Um, so again, is this necessary? You know, people will say, uh, and, I, and nothing is necessary, but it's another tool, um, especially for peak week when clients are sending me just bad pictures and different lighting. Um, it's kind of hard sometimes to make all the right calls. Um, so anyways, how I use it in the off season. Um, first off, I don't usually start this off with um, new clients that are new into the sport. Um, I don't need to add um, another thing that might complicate things or make this seem harder than it needs to be. This is usually for clients that are a little more um, advanced and I want more feedback as people get more advanced and uh, want to um, climb the ladder. As you know, the longer in the sport, the harder it gets to make uh, changes. So it's always nice to have as much feedback as you can as a coach. So in the off season, um, here's what I do, you know, with the glucometer. Um, take your fasted blood sugar. Um, we want to see that definitely under 100 uh, milligrams per deciliter. And why 100? Well, uh, the American Diabetes Association and the medical uh, community all say that uh, over 100 um, – you're starting to get into pre-diabetes uh, territory, um, and we know diabetes is basically insulin resistance. I mean, that's that's what it is. Um, so we don't want to live in that state too long, and we know if you're insulin resistant, um, you're more likely to store body fat. Um, your inflammation in your body is going to be much higher, so we don't want to be there. So. What I try to do with my off seasons, uh, more advanced competitors, is just say, hey, take a fasted blood sugar twice, uh, once every two weeks, um, put it on your chart, and let's just watch it. And as I'm upping calories and carbs, if I'm seeing that climb and climb and climb, I'm going to um, I'm gonna watch how much carbs I add. I might switch into carb timing. I might realize that I've pushed too many carbs uh, with the client and it's time to up the protein, up the fats, and drop the carbs. Um, we know that caloric deficits will reset insulin sensitivity, but we also know that you can go into ketogenic diets as well. Um, so if the client's on 2,500 calories and I really don't want to drop their calories, I might go 70% of that into fats and 30% into protein and, and let them do that for a few weeks and just track it. And It normally falls back into the 80s, 70s uh, in four, four weeks or so. And then now we're at a spot where we're much more insulin sensitive. And so we're going to be storing uh, more of our carbs where we want and less into the fat cell. So that's a way to kind of monitor things and really not get too far ahead of ourselves uh, in the off season so that we have to mini cut. And like I said, I don't do this with everybody. Um, but for those eager to learn, and if I'm not doing it with you as a client um, and you feel you're more advanced now, we can certainly start. Um, but, you know, like I said, with my more advanced people, um, I definitely start putting it in. So um, another way you can track this is we know that um, after you eat in the postprandial period, um, your blood sugar is going to spike uh, usually uh, around 45 to one hour. Um, we don't want to see this any higher than 140. If that's going higher than 140, that's also a sign of losing insulin sensitivity. And this should be back to your baseline which you should have a good idea about because you've taken it fasted. It should be back to your baseline um, about two hours, uh, tops about two and a half hours after the meal. So if it's staying elevated, let's say you know um, your, your sugars have been rolling around 85, but now after you eat, they're staying elevated in 100 after two and a half hours, that's a sign of insulin insensitivity as well. Um, so that's another number uh, that can be tracked as well. But usually I just do fasted and try to keep that uh, out of the 90s and definitely anything over 100, I'm going to pull back with the athlete, get the body inflammation down, reset insulin sensitivity. Um, so obviously, knowing this tool is fairly powerful. You can um, kind of keep your body uh, you know, in a growth phase longer and uh, partitioning nutrients better. Now, there are people that just run high. Um, I've had uh, one figure client who's ripped. 
Uh, her baseline's been 90 to 95, and when I talked to her about it, she did have a parent that was just diagnosed as a type 2. So she's going to run a little higher. So that's definitely something that we're going to take into consideration in her off-season. We might put just enough carbs in for her to grow, um, keep those numbers under 100, and use a lot more protein and fats. Um, so not everyone's going to be in the 70s or 80s, especially if you're genetically inclined to potentially end up a type 2 diabetic. But by knowing this number, as you're in this sport and you're eating more than your body wants, it's nice to know. I mean, uh, no matter who you are, if you're trying to grow, you're going to eat more calories than your body really wants to have. Um, so it's good for off season. How do I do it during prep? So preps here, we're going to load um, that morning before you load. I'm going to take a base. I'm going to have you take a baseline reading. Okay. I like to see this 70 or 80, but like I said, some people are just prone to being higher, but now we at least know that and have that baseline. We would know that coming in, but let's say I wasn't using it with them in the prep, but we're going to use it for loading. We want that pre-eating uh, fasted number, so that's going to be our baseline. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and eat first meal. And then every two hours, because we know that sugars are supposed to be back to baseline after two hours in a healthy person with good insulin sensitivity, we're going we're gonna to test it again in two hours, five minutes before you're going to eat another meal. And we want to see that back to baseline. Okay. Usually the first three, four meals, it's going to stay. Um, so it should be back to baseline after that first meal. Go ahead and have a carb meal. We're going to wait two hours again. You're going to test it five minutes prior to your next meal. Let's say you're about five carb meals deep, 250, 300 in. Your baseline that morning was 85, and now you're running about 110. Usually what I'm going to do is tell someone, hey, why don't we just wait 30 minutes, test it again, give those carbs more time to seat. Because if your blood sugars aren't returning, what's that mean? The blood sugar glucose glycogen is circulating in your system, right? It hasn't found a seat. It hasn't found a place to load. So you're obviously starting to get your stores fuller. So we're going to just give it 30 minutes, see if they seat. If you turn, you know, you take it and you're now down in the 90s, I'm easily going to say go ahead and load another carb meal. But now I at least know that it's starting to slow down. So we do another carb meal. Wait two hours. Test it five hour, five minutes again before. Let's say this time it's up to 120. Usually I'm going to just go ahead and say, wait 30 minutes, go ahead and let's do a protein fat meal. And I already have told them what their protein and fat meal macros were going to be um, when we get to this situation. Then we're going to wait two more hours and usually it's back down. But again, we know sensitivity is slowing. It's taking longer for carbs to find their home. So we'll have a protein and carb meal. We'll wait two hours and let's say now, like I said, it's about our seventh meal. Now we're up in the 130s. I'm going to say wait 30 minutes and have a protein fat meal and let's call it for the day and uh, shut it down. And usually that last meal I'm going to do um, a steak or something as long as we know that they, they do well with beef and then um, up to four to five tablespoons of almond butter uh, for men and maybe three to four for women. What those carbs are going to do, it's going to help seat the uh, glycogen so it doesn't burn overnight because your metabolism is now going to be spiked from, um, from loading. And then in the morning, we're going to test again. Um, usually, I get about 900 carbs in on my load day before I start to really stay up in the 120s, 130s. Uh, I know for Masters Nationals, I woke up, and I, th I looked great, and I was still at 110, and I wasn't hungry. So I took all that biofeedback and said, you know what? There's no need for carbs here. I just did protein and fats uh, the whole morning um, up until um, right before I went on stage, and then I hit um, – some fast acting sugars, uh, some coconut water uh, to get potassium in, and then I had some uh, about a quarter teaspoon of sea salt too to get that sodium potassium pump going with the fast sugars to seat those. And um, I pumped right up and it worked really well. But had I not known those numbers and I woke up that morning, you know, sometimes you're tempted to say, God, I know I got to get carbs in, I got to get carbs in. Um, but I just felt like no hunger. My blood sugars were already. 30 points above my baseline, uh, why push it? I look good, let's just do protein and fast, that's gonna hold the load, and then I'll get some carbs in right before stage. Um, and it really got me vascular, and, and, and it worked really well. So that's kind of the theory um, in loading. One thing to note is when you're dehydrated, your blood sugars are gonna be elevated. So um, when you're pushing water high, um, and one girl recently, I loaded her on Friday, and we're, we're pushing water high all week, and um, Thursday was two gallons. She woke up down about three or four pounds, and her blood sugars were 117 when they'd been like 95 
coming into peak week. And she was kind of flipping out. And I said, well, you know, you dropped a lot of water. You're dehydrated. Let's just go ahead and eat and then take, take your reading in two hours. And I bet it'll be back to baseline. And it was. So don't flip out. Um, if during peak week you get an odd reading, especially the morning you're about to load, especially after you've been pushing water and if you used Expel or something like that, it's probably just dehydration. Um, so you got to take that into account that dehydration can spike uh, blood sugars. Um, so that's just a little uh, insight into how to use uh, the glucometer. Um, take it for what it's worth. Um, there's great coaches that don't use it and they bring their people in great. But like I said, I have a lot of people during peak week who will send me pics at their house. And then they'll be on the road, so I'll get picks at a rest station. Then they'll get to their hotel. And, I mean, it's all different lighting. And, I mean, we know how different lighting can affect the look of the physique. And, you know, I obviously am asking, are you full? Are you starving? Are you bloating? You know, asking all those. But now we've got a way to look inside the body and see if those carbs are, uh, are loading into the muscle. Um, and, if they're, and if they're starting to circulate, there's no home for them. Um, or the homes are getting, you know, more filled up. So... You know, then you can hit a protein fat meal, give those carbs time to find a seat rather than now push more carbs on the body and risk spilling. So I hope you can kind of see the application. Don't think I'm crazy here. But again, um, if you've got your peaks down to a science, uh, maybe you don't need to mess with this. If you're a coach who has it down to a science and you feel like you, you nail it every time, do it. But if you feel like you could actually get people just a little fuller, maybe play with it. Um, I know for my uh, junior nationals and master shows, I use this both times. And another nice thing about it is I was so calm because not only did I have my own biofeedback, but I had to look inside my body to know what, what next move to make. Sometimes you, you think you know the move, but it's nice to see like blood sugar at 80. You're like, oh yeah, I, I, I'm good. You know, sensitivity is awesome. Let's push more carbs. It just gives you a sense of calm. And anytime you can keep that cortisol lower, you're going to look better. Um, one thing I would should also note is I do use glucose disposal agents while I'm doing this. Um, a nice way to do it is one Slentrol from Natty Nutrition with, let's say, your first carb meal. And then the next meal, you could use Berberine. Um, you could also use Metformin. Um, but if you're going to do that, only do like 250 Um Metformin does affect carb uh, loading. It doesn't. It doesn't allow all of them uh, to pass through the digestive tract, is the way I understand it. Um, or some are wasted in digestion due to it. So, um, but it's a way to extend your insulin sensitivity, get more carbs in. Um, so berberine, though, and tests have been shown to be just as good as metformin. Um, so, you know, over the counter, get like 250 mg berberine tablets and go one Slentrol, one berberine back and forth. And that's going to keep you drier. It's going to keep your insulin sensitivity better. It's going to let you get those carbs in and where you need them. So those are just some tips. How to use a glucometer off season, how to use a glucometer during peak, take it for what it's worth. If you think I'm nuts, that's totally fine, but it works well for me as a coach and a competitor. So that's it. Talk to you later.